Hi, my name is Judy and I'm the City Stitcher and welcome to my Floss Tube channel. Today is Sunday, January 17th. We are over halfway through the month of January. I know, a little frightening to say out loud, but you know, facts are facts. Um, it is a reasonably sunny day here today, blustery as usual. I feel like every time I get on here I'm saying it's, it's the wind is blowing like mad and I feel like it's been blowing like mad all month, but anyway. It is what it is. Um, I'm filming a little later in the day than I was expecting to, because um, as you can tell, I have changed my location yet again. Uh, so yeah, location number three, we're still working on uh, what the optimal location is uh, for winter time filming. Um, but, uh, and with that, every time I change locations, I have to figure out what the setup's gonna be and, you know, Anyway, all sorts of stuff on how to make a floss tube and get it set up so that, you know, I'm at least, you can see me. Um, so anyway, so I'm filming a little later than I was expecting to, so the lighting in here is not quite what I thought it was going to be because I'm filming later, but we're probably going to try it again next week and see what happens. Um, but with that, uh, you're not here to hear about all my woes about which where I'm actually going to film my floss tube so let's move on to other things so I am gonna start with the the stitching component uh, of this video so what have I been stitching on this week well we all know what I've been stitching on this week I'm gonna start with the never-ending nativity um, otherwise known as the Marbeck nativity which is a yes which is a five paneled nativity scene uh, three of the panels are complete. I am working on camel. So this one is not complete and the camel is not complete. I'm working on the camel. So this is what the camel up close looks like. So I have made some, some stitching progress here this week. Um, so I have uh, finished all of the half stitches down here in the bottom so three separate colors I'm not finished on the bottom here yet there's still two colors of grass to go in and uh, some rocks that need to go in um, and the part that you can barely tell oh I don't know Three colors of back stitching have gone into the top of the blanket or saddle, as they like to call it in the instructions, on the top of the camel. So one DMC and two colors of Krynik. To be perfectly honest, I'm not sure that the third color of Krynik was really necessary. There's a part of me that says I think I liked it better before I put the third one in. But you also know at this point, you know, so I started and I looked at it and went, mm, I'm not sure this is really adding anything. But I also said to myself, you know, stitch, put all of it in. Because when you've only done part of it, it may not look like when you've, you know, it may look different once all of it's in. But of course, once all of it's in, I'm still going. I'm not sure the third color was necessary. Not that you can necessarily see it in there. Um, but I'm also not willing to take it out either. <laughs> Got to there and was like, well, it's in and it is it is what it is. It doesn't look horrible. I'm not, I'm, you know, do I think it's, like, if it, if I looked at it and I said, like, that's not, that's not good. That was, I don't know why the instructions say that. I would, that I would take out because then I would feel like it was detracting from the piece. But in this instance, it's okay. It didn't make it better. Um, do I think, yeah. I think I liked it slightly better without it, so it made it slightly worse, but very slightly. Um, but it is what it is. So two colors of grass, rocks to put in, and then we're on to the really scary stuff that I don't really know how to do. So I do spend time, I've spent time several nights this week reading the instructions and looking at the pattern and going like, okay, anyway. So check back next week and see where I'm at. I'm trying to convince myself that I'm going to be really good and not be afraid of doing the things that I've never done before because it'll be fine. 
because it's stitching. It'll always be fine one way or another. It will be fine. Um, so I just need to make myself do it. So check back. So progress. So I did do progress, you know, and it's one of those instances where I felt like I had spent a reasonable amount of time working on the camel this week until you look at it like this, where you go like, I feel like it hardly looks like I've done anything this week, but I did three colors of backstitching in that crazy little, you know, saddle blanket thing. Okay. Three more colors down here and then we're on the really hard stuff. So we'll see what I have to say when I get there. So that's the camel. And again, with a new, a new location, new things about where am I putting this? Uh, and so this, the other one, uh, which I'm still working on my new year, new start, which is Lady Scarlet's Journey. Uh, so that's what the whole, all three parts together are supposed to look like. And so, uh, as I said last week, I had completed all of, uh, part one. And I'm now just looking at my thing saying I should probably adjust my scroll rights just a smidge to make it look a little bit better. There we go. Okay. So, here is Lady Scarlet's journey. Uh, and so the end of, ban of part one was back up here. So I've done... I can't even tell you how many bands I've done. One, two, three, three complete bands, and I've started on the fourth. Um, and I did enjoy uh, last week when I was going through the names of the bands, so I thought, you know, this week I should probably go through the bands that I've done here. Uh, so this is uh, the Pond of Leaping Frogs, so two really small backstitched frogs followed by Strawberry Grasshoppers, uh, followed by, so this one band here is uh, Summer Grass is Drying, which hard to tell, but it's actually uh, a specialty stitch, uh, which is called the Greek Cross, which is done with two different, with one strand of two different DMC colors tweeted together. Uh, so summer grass is drying out. I have completed sheep in the meadow, other than I need to put my mouse in there. Um, and now I am work. Oh, that's not true. I think, yes. No, I got that mixed up. Oh yeah. So this is hide in the tall meadow grass which I don't think that grass looks that tall, but that's what they're calling it. And then I have started working on the first signs of fall. So it's the 17th of January and I'm working on the first signs of fall in this particular pattern. Slightly amusing to me. But I will tell you, this band that I am currently working on, so far, I will say by far, is my least favorite band of all. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. One, this wretched squirrel, and I mean that in the nicest way possible. Uh, so done over one, I put it in and discovered I was off both. Uh, so I was short a whole row, and even now, I, I don't know which row it was that I missed. Uh, so I was, sh I was short a whole row, it was one stitch off horizontally. I just got just like the whole, like everything about this squirrel is, is something is off in this squirrel. But by then I had almost done all of it, which meant I had, I ended up having to take it all out and taking out um, one over one is a pain in the neck, period. I did it back. I did it back up here on the one over one bluebirds up here, way up at the top. It's a lesson to me saying, I, I should not be doing one over one. I don't do it well. I don't, I don't know what the problem is. I can't seem to count. I get it wrong. I don't do it well. Again, it was just a big gigantic reminder to me that 
you know, I don't like one over one and there's a reason for that. Will I do one over one? Of course, because even in this project, there was one over one in part one. There's one over one in part two. I'm not, I'm refusing to even look at part three to see if there's one over one. I'm ignoring that part. So I put it in, had to rip it out, not unstitch it. This was a full on, it needed to be ripped out. It was bad. So unhappy with that. In the process of unripping, somehow managed to snag part of the border. So, <laughs> so then I had to sort of unstitch that part, weave those ends in, restitch the part that I'd taken out with new floss, because I, you know, somehow sliced, anyway, long story. It was a, a big gigantic thing of saying, like, one over one is not your jam. Um, and then um, these acorns. So in this particular, so this is uh, an over dyed silk that came with the pattern um, called Autumn Foliage. So I don't know what the maker is. I don't know if it's unique to Just Nan or in my head, I'm thinking it might be a thread gatherer, but it certainly does not reference that on the chart anywhere. So don't quote me on that one. It's called Autumn Foliage. I started, you know, so I finally, you know, got the squirrel done and I was like, fine, just do the dumb backstitching on here. And I did the first acorn and I hated it. Hated it, hated it, hated it. So I need to revisit, I need to revisit how I'm gonna do those acorns. Yeah, great. But I need to, I need to do that. So that's my project for tonight is I need to I need to figure out what I'm doing on those acorns and get them done. I'm I'm in the in the land of oh my goodness I just need to get this band completed because it I'm not doing well I'm not doing well with it at all I'm screwing it up I don't like what I'm doing I just need to get through it and move on because the two bands below that look quite quite manageable and so hopefully by the middle of by the middle of this week. Part two will be completed, except for, again, I'm still not putting the buttons in and I'm not putting in the charm. So there's the mouse that belongs in there and then there's random uh, beads that go on here. This next button here, this next button, this next band. Uh, these are grapes, so all of the grapes are beads. So there's a lot of, so that should be a really fast band to do because there's a lot of beads on it. And I'm, since I'm not putting in the beads until the end, and then they're gonna go in. Um, but yes, so that's coming along. Um, so yeah, my goal is by end of day Wednesday to have part two completed. So wait for it. Um, aside from beads and charms, uh, two patterns completed in 2021. I know I'm counting my chickens before they're hatched because I technically have not completed part one because I haven't done the beads and charms on that one and I haven't done the beads and charms on this one. So I'm technically counting a little bit in advance, but I'm still saying two, two, two whole patterns, almost virtually complete and should be easy to complete. And then uh, once we're through that, we will move into part three, which is really quite frankly, the Christmas one. So I don't want to jinx myself by saying what I'm going to get accomplished by the end of the month. Um, but I'm hoping middle of this week, uh, part two will be completed. So I'm making progress on my 20 year old chart that I'm finally getting around to stitching on. So yeah, so that is my, so that's what I've been working on this week. Again, I can't say this was my favorite week of stitching because I was doing the things I didn't like. I didn't love the back stitching on the camel. Um, this one was going along swimmingly until I hit there. And then this was just a disaster, which the funny thing about the disaster is that that's really what propelled me to do more stitching on the camel. Because <laughs> it was like, do you want to keep going on this band or would you rather work on the camel? And it's bad when it comes out, I'd rather work on the camel. Anyway, it is what it is. Progress was made on two charts this week, which is which is the goal. I'm not a, I'm not a good. I'm still working at trying to improve 
how I balance two projects. So it really is saying to me that I'm, I'm really only good at being monogamous, which in a lot of facets of life are, are a very positive attribute for people who like to see a lot of variety when they come to a floss tube channel. <laughs> Sorry, this is probably, you'll, you'll probably only need to watch about once a month. And for those of you who like to see 27 different projects, once a month will be fine for you because you'll have, you'll be able to gauge <laughs> what it looks like. Um, and with that, let's talk about stash acquisitions. Have any moments in my lab goes? Okay, so uh, fabulously, I'm doing very well on my Stitch from Stash plan for 2021. And so I have not shopped for anything this week. Now, it was bad because I was watching a floss tube channel. And remember last week I said there was something that I was contemplating purchasing last Saturday. But by the time I, I even, I even went on to the site, you know, I was totally at risk of, of doing some purchasing. By the time I got in there, the thing that I was uh, looking at was sold out. It was gone. So save, saved by delaying. Um, Anyway, um, but I did watch a floss tube this week where someone purchased the item I was looking at and it, uh, it really, it really is lovely. I would have loved to have had it, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it is not life-saving medication. Um, it is, um, you know, it's not, it's not something where my world would be drastically for the better by having it. Would have been a little bit nicer having had it in my world but technically no damage done um, so uh, have done well about uh, not not coveting anything so far over this last week so that's also positive um, you know designers are starting to release new patterns and I've done very well this week um, some of them have come out and they are, even though they're uh, designers that I like, um, some of the stuff that has come out this week is, it's just not, it, it's not me, which is fine. I, there are people out there who are really enjoying them and I think that's fantastic. And I think this would be a great year for all of my favorite designers to do things for all of those other people. I think this would be a great year for them to design for design all of those things that don't necessarily um, sing sing for me, but sing for other people. I think that would be great. Uh, some of them are doing that. Uh, I've had a, a couple of charts that have come up as new, well, coming up as new releases where I I thought about them and went, well, maybe. But I've also done really well about saying to myself, okay, would you rather stitch that or would you rather stitch and then insert list of charts from that designer that I already have in my stash that I have not yet stitched? And so that's worked out very well for me this week as well. I have, uh, there's been a few that have come up and I've said, would you rather stitch this or that? And you're like, Oh, I, I'd actually rather stitch the one that I currently have in my stash more. Doesn't mean that I wouldn't want to stitch it. Um, but those particular charts are ones they are not limited edition. They're not shop exclusives. They're not, they're not those things. Those, those types of words would maybe make me think twice about it. Um, but there are, there are regular release. Um, and so I'm comfortable saying, um, you know, come 2022, those charts will still be available and you can purchase them in 2022. You could, I could purchase them even in 2021 because I do have a budget, but right now I am saving my budget, um, for other things that I may not do so well at. So there, yeah, that, that's what that is. So I've done well this week. So I have, uh, I have technically have not finished anything yet, although I'm coming close to a finish on part two of Lady Scarlet's journey. 
Um, I have not spent anything and I have not sold anything out of my stash. So um, for this particular week for Stitch from Stash, Stitch, oh, Stitch from Stash, there we go. Um, it's goose eggs for all the line items in the spreadsheet that I'm keeping because I'm, you know, weird like that. Anyway, um, so that's my Stitch from Stash update. Um, after talking about Just Nan last week and having that moment saying, I think probably the reason why I ended up not picking any of my Just Nan Christmas charts is because I felt it was January and, you know, it would look a little weird showing all of my Christmas charts. And then I decided that's ridiculous because it's totally fine stitching Christmas any time of the year. So this week, um, I've hauled out some of, I'm calling this Just Nan, the Christmas version. <clears throat> so again, I will say that these are older charts from my stash. Um, this is not all of the Christmas charts, but it is most of them. So there's not, not a lot after this. I know you're going to laugh when you see them, but anyway, so here we go. So this is called Christmas Joy. Another, and again, so this, this goes back to my whole, um, I, I like a, I like a good band sampler. Just Nan used to do a lot of band samplers, as you can see, and my voice is having a terrible time. I don't know what's going on. Um, <clears throat> um, so here's, here's Christmas Joy. This is one of the older ones. This is Just Nan Pattern 10. Does it have a copyright on it where I can see it easily? Apparently not. Nope, can't find it. But it's Just Nan chart number 10. So you know it's got to be not, not in the last couple of years because I think they're on chart 200 and something or other. Um, this is called Snowfire Christmas. Yeah, you're going to see a theme here. They're, you know, they're all variations on the theme. And sadly, I like each of them. This one is called Gingham Christmas. Now, it actually came um, with the gingham fabric in it. I do have to say, I think this particular gingham for this particular pattern overwhelms overwhelms the pattern. So I think one of the things that has held me back from this one is sort of saying in my head, you'll need to change the fabric, but I didn't necessarily know what I was going to change the fabric to. But if you will remember from one of my summer videos, I bought, I found some gray um, gingham uh, even weave. This, was, this is a linen, uh, so a gray gingham even weave. And so in my head, I'm going, maybe that's what I stitch this on. Because I, I think the red in this just overwhelms, overwhelms the chart itself. Um, but when you hold it up close and you can figure out what's going on in the chart, I think, I think the bands are lovely. I just don't think this is the right fabric to be doing it on. But that's me. Um... I do remember when this came out that there were lots of people who thought it was just fantastic on that gingham. And in real life, it may look fantastic on that gingham. Not saying that because I haven't seen it in real life. Uh, so this is Christmas Ribbons. Deck the Halls. So someone in the Just Nan Facebook group just finished this and they said, oh my goodness, it looks... Even, she's going, like, even the pictures I'm posting on the Facebook group do not do this pattern justice. So I was like, oh. I looked at it and said, I have that in my stash, but it is not on my stitching plan for 2021. I'm finishing Lady Scarlet's Journey. That's my January plan. Christmas Elegance. Yeah, it's turning into, if I actually got all of these stitched, I could probably have an entire wall Actually, I just said that I went, I even know the wall that it would be in my house where I could have all of these out during Christmas, but let's not get excited because that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, 
Christmas jewel. Which, to be perfectly honest, this would probably be the next one that I would want to work on. And then Christmas Eve. So again, similar to that one on gingham, you know, less Santas, more nutcrackers. So again, I think I think what you can tell from this collection of Just Nan charts from my stash is that I'm the one who, I like a band sampler. I like a band sampler. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and I have quite a few band samplers in my collection. Huh, I'm having a moment going, where did... Hang on a minute, I've lost the chart. Oh, there it is. I was gonna say, wait a minute. So, uh, with that, um, so I'm gonna show a previous finish. And because we're working on Just Nan January, um, I'm gonna show one of my Just Nan previous finishes. And this is also one where I have fully finished it, I know, two weeks in a row, two previous finishes that were fully finished. And so this is another Just Nan Snowflake. So this is called Ice Blossom. So this is what the chart looks like. And as usual, that's not exactly how I did mine. So there is my ice blossom. Now, I love this. I love how this turned out. I'm happy with all of my changes. And so what did I change and why did I change it? So a couple of reasons. Um, one, um, so what this is stitched on is a smoke, so the called for fabric in this chart is a smoky pearl cashel linen, so 28 count. And I'm quite sure when I got this at the store, um, you know, they had smoky pearl, but I found, I, I look at this and I think it looks drab. It's gray and I know I'm usually, I usually like a gray. Maybe Scarlet's being done on a gray. But in this context for this pattern, I found it, it was too dull. It didn't work for me. Yes, the white shows up beautifully on it, um, but it didn't work for me. So I, of course, go to my fallback position going, well, if gray isn't working for you, the next, the next best thing is blue. Now, this is also back before I started actually keeping track of, um, of what fabrics I was stitching my charts on. Um, you know, some of them I can just look at them and I can tell you exactly what this is. I don't actually know what this is. So this is an even weave. Uh, I want to say it's a Jobelin. It's in the periwinkle range of colors. And so then what I did is with that, um, so there was a Karen Water Lilies called Lavender Ice that is used in this, which is really hard to tell. So it's a very, very pale lavender pink. Um, but then sort of the colors that were going around it were Soie d'Algers. And all I did then was I, you know, went to the Soie d'Algers and I looked at the range that was more tonally the same as this and then picked out picked out the tones from those. So I did um, on my working copy, which I don't have beside me, I did actually write down what those Soie d'Alger numbers are. Um, so, you know, again, not too hard to change the colors on this because there is just so much white. And the beads that were going along with this were all either, you know, white, uh, silver, iridescent, whatever. So like none of the beads had to be changed. The Karen Water Lilies I did not change. I just changed a couple of the Soie d'Algers that are really going, you know, you can see them around sort of these flowers. So that is my previous finish called Ice Blossom with, uh, 
the not called for fabric and not all of the called for fibers from from the chart. A lot of them called for, but not all of them. Some slight some slight tweaks because I changed um, the background the background fabric, and I really do like this. I I was very happy with my with my finish. So that is my previous finish. And so if you're here just for the stitching and not here for the talk, thanks for stopping by and spending some time with me and I hope you've had a good week. If you're here for the talk, let's talk floss storage and organization. So I do need to caveat this right off the get-go. Am I an organizational expert? Uh, no, that's a laughable statement. At no point in my lifetime do I think I'm ever gonna be an organizational expert. Um, do I have experience with all of the methods of storing uh, and organizing floss? No. Have I tried several myself? Yes. Have all of them worked for me? No. Um, and that is one of the things that when you're looking at when people say this is what you should be doing with your floss, this is my caveat about everything. You should be stitching the charts that you want on the fabrics you want with the floss you want everybody else it doesn't matter it's your project do what you want so when it comes to floss storage and organization you need to figure out what works for you and what works for you could be really different than your friend or what everybody else is doing it doesn't matter so i'm just going to go through um sort of some of the most popular versions of floss storage and organization that I've heard discussed. Uh, again, I can't say that I personally have used all of them, but I can certainly say that um, I've seen a lot of discussion about these types of things. I have my own personal versions of why things don't work for me, and I can, I can let you know what those are. Um, but let's start off with uh, the floss organization method that I first was introduced to when I started stitching. And it's one that just about everybody has heard of or seen. Bobbinating your floss. So here's, um, that's funny. <laughs> See, I'm looking at my, the box I pulled and went, hmm, that's interesting. I'm using the DMC flower thread box, DMC flower thread, which is no longer being produced. Um, but so, you know, these are, so you take a skein of DMC and you wind them onto these bobbins. Now there's a little tool that you can use to help you, um, people use all sorts of different things. I'm not going to get into how you get it on the bobbin, how you get it onto the bobbin and what works best for you is up to you. Um, there are two versions of bobbins. There are the cardboard bobbins, which this is, and then there are the plastic bobbins. I have both in my collection. I have used both. I personally tend towards the cardboard ones, which may surprise some people because some people find them that they're too flimsy, they're, they don't stand up over time. That's why, that's why they like the um, the plastic ones better. The reason that I don't like the plastic ones is I find that on the ends, you know, where you're where you're uh, looping your your thread through, on the plastic ones, I find that it doesn't hold as well. And I find that uh, I have not yet found a reliable way to get the floss number onto the plastic bobbin where it stays for a very long period of time. And if you, hey, I'm stitching on a chart that I've had for 20 years, so you can only imagine how old some of my floss is. Um, so, you know, there's the DMC stickers, but I do find on, certainly on the plastic bobbins I've got, those tend to fall off within a, a fairly short period of time, particularly if I was using it in, in, a, in a floss box like this. Um, so, and, you know, using a Sharpie, eh, it's just, none of those things worked for me. 
Um, so I was very unhappy with my plastic bobbins. Um, so I tried them out, used them for a while, kept going like, this is awful. You know, when when the thing falls off at some point and you can't find it, like you're just like, now you're now I'm having to figure out what my D, what my DMC floss is. That's that's not a good spot for me to be in. Um, so for me, I'm a cardboard because I can just write on them. Apparently, my answer to standing up over time is I, I guess I'm just not that hard on my bobbins when I'm using them. But I can see, you know, people saying like these just do not stand up over time. And that's, hey, that's why there are cardboard bobbins and that's why there are plastic bobbins is because people have different views on what works for them. Oh yeah. Okay. And here's the, so here's the, here's the tool that I use. Um, I've had it for many, 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 many years. Um, you know, so you just put your bobbin on, attach it here. Wind, wind away. And I remember when I first started cross stitching coming back from that little trip on Boxing Day down to the store, um, I spent the rest of the afternoon bobbinating my threads because that's quite frankly when I started back in back in the old days. Um, you know, that's what there was. This is this is what every all of the stitchers in my family had um, had threads that their DMC threads were bobbinated. So this is pre pre fancy floss. <laughs> <laughs> that elderly, I know. Anyway, and like everybody else, uh, when you're bobbinating, I just have one of these standard Doris boxes that I put them in. There are, so my boxes are Doris boxes. There are other very similar boxes on the market that are not Doris. Um, I would just say to you, um, take a bobbin with you if you're going to the store and looking at non Doris brands. Because I have some where the way that the bobbin fits are, they fit differently. So, sounds a little bit weird, I know. Um, but, you know, and again, some of them, so mine, these are, um, the numbers are on the sides. Some of them are such that you can actually put them uh, so that the top of the bobbin, they're taller. So that you can easily um, have them up here. Again, you just need to know what works for you. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about, this comes up frequently when talking about floss storage. Do you keep it by color, number, or name? Or do you keep it by, like, do you put, like, all your greens together and your blues together? Do you do it by color ranges? So for me, I keep all of my stuff in color number. Like, so all of my DMC are in numerical order, period. I have a DMC color chart. I can work my way through that if I'm trying to figure something out. Um, but I, yeah, I just, for me, I just can't even imagine trying to keep them by color range because some, some of the colors I wouldn't necessarily know off the top of my head exactly which ones they are. So then to figure out where I've put them in the color ranges, that's just not going to work out for me. So my DMC for me is done by color number. And also it's because I have a finance background and I think numbers always make more sense to me. Now, so that's what I historically have done. I counted my boxes. So I have about 13 of these boxes in my stash right now. Some of them were mine because they were part of my collection. Um, and as I've said over you know the last however many months that I've been doing floss tube, I have actually inherited... Um, stashes from both my mother and my aunt and a little bit from my grandmother although she was not quite so much cross-stitching towards the end of her life but uh so that's so I wouldn't say that 13 is is the number that I would normally have if it were just me I have those because uh, I have an inherited some DMC stash that came to me bobbinated on cards in boxes and I am um working to a certain extent, trying to work my way through putting those with projects and using using those up. Um, so that's um, that's how I have historically stored my DMC floss. So clearly, you can tell from that sentence. Is that how I'm storing my DMC floss now? 
not so much. So this is an example of some DMC leftovers from a project that I was working on. Um, it's actually a Chatelaine Mandela that I did. Um, and these are the DMC five, not all of them, because I, I do try to move these into other projects as needed. Um, but this was a project where I wasn't exactly sure how much I was going to end up needing, how, I, how well I was going to do with doing a Chatelaine. And so I decided that I was going to use full skeins and kit it up with full skeins of DMC. And so when I was doing that project, I clearly did not bobbinate. So these are in floss away bags, which has become my preferred method of how I handle um, floss that is in use. We'll get to floss that is not in use after this. So floss that is in use. And this, the reason why this works better for me is a couple of reasons. One, I am working and have historically worked on projects where um, even Lady Scarlet's journey, the amount of, you know, you can look at this crazy border that I talked about that has three stitches of one color, three stitches of another color, followed by three stitches of a third color. So the amount of floss that you're going to take off of a six strand, you know, like a DMC, like I don't need to take an 18 inch length because, I mean, I could, but I do the loop method and all this kind of stuff. And so I usually try to gauge what I'm stitching and how much floss I'm going to need to accomplish that. And so I don't want to take off an 18 inch length of floss and work with that because I'm going to end up having to whittle it down a little down and then it'll get to this thing where it's just unusable. And so I try, I try to gauge how much I'm really going to need to accomplish what I'm stitching. Do I miscalculate that? You bet. Um, and so I also end up with weird straggling pieces, which ridiculous as it seems, I am reluctant to throw away. And what floss away bags allow me to do is I, I can have, so here's an example of, I had a little bit of leftover and then I had a much bigger chunk down here. And so that's just, that's how that one worked out. And there are many times where it has saved me where I've done something and I go back and I'm looking at it and I've had that, the horrible realization where you look at it and go like, oh, I missed one stitch of that blasted color. And doing it this way, I usually have some weird little scrap in my, in my floss away bag where I can say, okay, that's big enough. I'll be able to get a stitch out of that and finish it off and everything's fine. Um, but that's why I do it. And it lets me, it lets me tell how much of the skein I've got left. It lets me have, say, here's the larger section that I was clearly using for something, that this was the right length for that. And I've got this weird piece of leftover. But I can have all of those in a bag and I can easily look at my bag and go, okay, I know what I've got. And how I'm going to attack, you know, whatever it is that I'm stitching next. And so for me, that's the benefit of the floss away bag. If I had put these on bobbins, like if I got there and I didn't need this small one, I needed the longer one, I'd probably have to take that off. Then I'd have to take off the next one. And that's the part where I go like, I don't like that. That's like, I can't tell for the part that's been rewound back onto the bobbin. It's, there's no easy way for me to tell how long that piece is. Whereas when I put it in a floss away bag, this is really easy for me to tell where, where I'm at with what's in the bag, what's still, you know, what's still fully skeined up and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, you can say, yeah, I've got it in a few colors where, you know, but again, so for another project, so when I go to use, um, one of these colors in another project, this also gives me a reasonable assessment of how much I have left of any given color. And so I am trying to be really good about pulling from existing skeins as long as the project is not too big. That it clearly says you're gonna need, like I was kidding up one for 2021 where it said, you're gonna need five skeins of DMC of this color. And the answer to that is you're gonna need five skeins. So I don't know that I'm necessarily gonna take a, a leftover bit 
Uh, I think I kitted that up one with just full on five new skeins. You know, when I get there, you know, will I look at look at what I've got going and potentially pick up a floss away bag that already has some of that color in? Probably. We'll see. Um, so I am moving, I'm trying to use up the stuff that I have on bobbins, but I am trying to move it into what I'm starting on projects where, you know, if I need to get a color that I didn't have in my stash, I'm putting them in floss away bags. Even when I'm kidding up a, a project where I am using bobbinated floss, the bobbin is actually going in a floss away bag on a ring. And you can get these, you can get these rings off of Amazon as well. You can get bags, like 100 bags of Flossway bags that come with a three inch ring. I'm hoping that I am not kidding up a lot of projects that require 100 colors. Um, um, so I, I go to Amazon, um, look for binder, binder ring, and then pick your size. One inch, two inch, two and a half inch, one and a half inch, anywhere between one and three inches. And I do have some of all of those in my stash because, you know, this one happens to be a big one because there were a lot more fibers on here. Um, but that is not always the case. So here, for example, is a bunch of uh, floss away bags, leftover floss away bags that I've just put onto another ring, which is clearly smaller. So, so that's floss away bags. So I've, I'm working from transitioning from bobbinated to floss away bags. I'm doing floss away bags. I have a friend who um, doesn't like the fact that floss away bags are plastic. Uh, long term, what happens to your floss when they're in plastic um, is up for debate. I am comfortable keeping my flosses in floss away bags for a couple of reasons. One, I do not live in a very humid climate. I don't, and I don't know if living in one of those climates would change my position, but they are factors into my decision. Um, I don't live in a very humid climate. Um, my house, you know, doesn't get overly warm. Um, you know, anyway. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if I if I were down in the Caribbean, would I keep them in, in these in these plastic bags? I don't know. That's where that's where it might actually it might change my opinion. But I don't know because I've never I visit those places. I've never lived in one of those places, so you'll have a better sense of that than I would. Um, and so for her, she doesn't like the plastic, and so what she does is she puts hers in organza bags. Now, that sounds like that could be a really expensive venture, uh, depending on where you're getting them from. But again, um, between the dollar store or Amazon or those, those types of places, she has actually managed to find, you know, hundreds of organza bags that she is putting her, her fibers into. One, she doesn't like the plastic. Two, she also goes, but they're prettier. <laughs> and hey, there's nothing wrong with saying I want my stuff to look pretty, how it's being stored, whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I haven't chosen to do that. You know, could I get there? Maybe, but I'm I'm content with with what I'm doing right now. Could it change? Sure. Okay. So that's bobbinating. That's floss away bags. That's organza bags. I'm gonna talk about the DMC stitch bows. I don't have them. Um, however, many years ago it was that DMC came out and said we've got this new pro product. It's gonna change how you how you organize and store your floss and it's going to change your life. I was, I was all excited and I'm like, and then it came out and I went, mm, I don't know that that changes things for me. So I don't have an example here, but they're called stitch bows and they are a plastic thing that what you do is you take the two, these two pieces of paper on a skein of DMC, you take them off and it is the exact length that if you open this, you know, if you find the two, you know, halves, that it loops onto it and keeps it taut like this. Um, so again, for me, when I looked at that, I went, well, what, what does that, what do you do with your leftovers? 
technically they say they've got these ends where you can wind them around there, but as you can see from the leftovers that I have in my floss away bags, that's that's not going to work out any better for me than than bobbinating was. And so there are people out there who use it, who think that they're awesome. They've got large, large uh, packages of how you contain those, those stitch bows. They've got project sized ones. Um, again, there are people who really like them. They don't work for me because they don't work for how I use my floss. That's me. Um, so another way that is coming up a lot in the discussions these days are um, thread drops. And again, I don't have any to show you because I don't use them. But I will take, so for example, um, here's a skein of Classic Color Works, Plum, Plum Paisley in case you were wondering there the color name. Um, a thread drop, it really is like a cardboard piece a cardboard fiber it quite frankly looks very similar to this you can get prettier ones than this you can get ones that are on really heavy cardstock I think there are ones that are coming out that are actually a little more plastic I don't know if there are 100% plastic ones I don't know because I don't I don't research them that well and really they have a hole at the bottom where you thread your floss onto and a hole generally a hole at the top um, so that you can put them on a, on a binder ring. And again, so for me, the problem with a thread drop is what do you do with the scraggly bits? And I understand for the people who use thread drops, they go, what in, what in the world are you doing even pretending to save those scraggly bits? The answer is I save the scraggly bits because invariably I'm the person who needs some weird scraggly little bit to, you know, fix something or do something that I've missed or whatever, which is why I keep the scraggly bits. Other people, when they get to those scraggly bits, they just trash them. They go like, this is an unusable size of floss. And so I think the people who use um, thread drops, it's because you're, the way you're stitching and what you're stitching is conducive to where generally you're using, you know, threads in this length. You know, for me, the problem is I don't mind this length, but sometimes I only need a length that's like that. So that's that's where the thread drops don't work for me. And again, you know, primary example, welcome, welcome to this. You know, the number of color changes in here, you know, this this pond one, each one of those flowers has, you know, there's a total of 10 stitches in there and each one of those flowers has three colors. So again, for me, pulling off an 18 inch length of floss isn't going to be conducive to the type of stitching that I personally am doing and certainly not at this moment. If you are using, if you're doing a monochromatic pattern, you know, do thread drops potentially make sense? Sure, because you're stitching in a monochromatic or um, one, an overdyed thread, but you're using all of that overdyed thread, you know, for one pattern, this may work. Again, the harder part for me, even for, an, if it was monochromatic, chromatic, where it's like a DMC solid colored something, okay, maybe I'm still not going to do well with the leftover bits. So still not going to move to thread drops. Um, the harder part for me is the way that I stitch with overdyed flosses even on a piece where that's all I'm using for it is because of the way that I like to join, join the flosses up as, you know, one, one, th one strand ends and I start using the next strand, how I choose to, um, attach those and what I'm doing with those means that I need to start from a certain spot. Um, and again, for me, I, I find that harder, even from, from the ones that I've seen using thread drops, it, I just go, wow, that, that's just going to be hard for me to accomplish. And so anything, anything that makes my life, my stitching harder is not something I'm going to do. Do people love their thread drops? Are they changing everything they're doing that they possibly can to thread drops? I think that's great. They have found a method of storing and organizing their threads that works for them. That's great. And again, 
the the trick to having a storage method that works for you is find the one that works for you not the one that works for somebody else so those are thread drops um and again the way some people are doing them so they're um so shelia from sunshine stitchers is is the best known that i've got for storing all of her flosses on thread rings um so on thread effectively on thread drops it, it again this is technically not a thread drop but for all intents and purposes it works like a thread drop so you can put all of these and she's got them stored on a pegboard in her in the room where she stores her stitching supplies and i think that's great for her there's a part of me that really loves that because it is um it's visually stimulating it looks fantastic um when I'm changing colors, if I could just say it's like they were all in front of me, ugh, wouldn't that be fantastic? The problem is, is that I don't have a spot in my home where I want to keep my flosses out on a pegboard. And lots of stores use pegboards. Why? Because you can put all of them out there and they have all of that stuff and you can, you know, someone like me can walk in and you can see all the colors and you can figure out what you're doing or whatever. Um, I just don't have a spot in my home that I actually want to put a pegboard up. Second of all, um, for me, the issue is, okay, I have a lot of stash, more stash than I probably should have. Um, but the answer is I don't want all of those threads hanging out on a pegboard for that amount of time, you know, some of these things, if they were hanging out on a pegboard, they would have been hanging out on the pegboard for 20 years. <laughs> Anywho, so uh, that's not how I store my... It works for some people, and I think that's great. If you're in and you're using your stuff and, and that's what works for you, I think that's fantastic. Visually, I think it looks, I, I think it looks fantastic, and I love how it looks visually. I just know that for me, it doesn't work. For me, long term, it doesn't work in my home. And again, you've got to find the solution that works for you. Um, I'm going to talk about one thing because um, it gets into sort of the storage aspect. So floss away bags. And so this is called a floss box. And I'm going to tell you right now, they are no longer making these. I actually had a hard time even finding getting this one when I was originally getting it. Um, this was it in the beginning of my journey to floss away bags. Um, the part that I liked about the floss boxes, so, and again, if you're really smart and you know how to do stuff, you can probably figure this out. But there are these two side railings on here. And um, when you bought your floss box, you got these um, ones. So they've got, uh, I'm trying to figure out, how, there you go. They've got these edges. So they're like a, a really small filing folder thing for floss away bags. So they were called floss packs. And they came with, um, that's not the best one. Let's pick one of these ones. They came with these tabs up top for you to put your labels on, which as you can tell, not labeling mine. Why? Because I want to be able to change them all the time. And for example, for this, like this is, you know, this is a rainbow gallery card that I used for another project um, and clearly has a lot of leftover. So it clearly can be used for something else. And so I'm storing them in my floss box. Um, so this is where I'm keeping my rainbow gallery and my silk threads. Um, and so um, this, it's decently full at the moment. So that's part of my problem is that if I have to add too many more to this, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because I can't get another one of these. I really like them. I really like them. But, and worst result is that I put them on a binder ring and I keep like fibers together. So I could put all my Soi Dalgés together. I could put all my classic color works together. Um, again, so that's, that's the floss box. I really wish I could get floss boxes, but I can't because I would like another one. If I could ever find another one, I would probably find two. So in your travels, if you happen to stumble across a floss box, please let me know because <laughs> I would want one of those. 
Um, so what do you do with floss away bags when you're done with them? So if you don't like the rings, the other suggestion, the other things that people have, and I thought I pulled one out and apparently I did not. Um, so shoe boxes, um, you know, just get one of those shoe boxes, um, as long as you've labeled them really well, or you know how you're doing your labeling. Again, I don't label any of mine because I leave the tags in there and I sort of go, that's, that's how I choose to do mine. I actually don't put labels on the bags themselves because I want to be able to reuse them for whatever I choose to use them at any point in time. Um, but you can put them in shoe boxes. Um, if you don't, if you sort of go floss away bags are lovely and I love the concept, but I can't afford a floss away bag. Uh, there are lots of people out there who are using, uh, so from the grocery store, the snack bags. So you get the smallest bag. Again, don't forget, you're using them for floss. This is not the biggest thing in the face of the, like the sandwich bags are too big. Find the smallest version of um, the plastic bags that are, you know, sandwich bags, freezer bags, blah, blah, blah. As far as I know, the smallest ones that I see in the store are the snack bags. Buy a box of those, put them in the snack bags, put them in a shoe box, you're in the same spot. Um, other things that are out there, there are, so similar to bobbinating, there are the, the pretty versions of the bob, things that you can bobbinate on, they're um, floss winders. So um, there's floss flowers, they, they come in various assorted shapes and sizes. Um, you know, if that, again, if the concept of bobbinating, but you want them to be prettier or you want them to look different, um, those are the, the types of things that you're going to be looking for. Again, I have no examples of those because I'm in fact moving my storage away from bobbinating anything or winding it on anything into floss away bags as I use them. Um, I feel like I had one more and I don't know what it is. Bag, bag, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so those are, those are some of the options. Uh, again, if you're just starting out, I would say try not to invest too heavily in any one given thing until you figure out what works for you and how you stitch and the types of projects that you're veering towards. Again, when I started back in the good old days, in the olden days, where quite frankly, generally the only thing that people did was bobbinate and put them on those bobbins and put them in the, in the boxes. That's all, all I saw for many years when I started stitching. And if it works for you, you have to find the thing that works for you, how you're stitching, what you're using. You know, if you're doing a lot of canvas work, um, these, uh, some of these storage methods aren't necessarily going to work for you. Um, there is a Facebook group. I think it's called cross stitch storage and organization or something like that. I will put a link to that Facebook group below. Again, that's a Facebook group that I look in and if nothing else, it's always fun to look at people's stitchy spots and how they're choosing to organize things and how organization works for them. Um, so if you're looking for ideas or suggestions, that's a great group to great group to look for on storage and organization for anything, not just floss. Um, and I always laugh. I chose this topic because January is, if you're looking at organizing topics, um, they tend to sort of say Jan January is a month where if you could just get everything organized, your year is going to get off to a great start. And I think it really would. I just don't tend to get everything organized. Anyway, whatever. Anyway, so that is this week's topic. Um, those, again, those are just some of the options. Uh, again, my recommendation is figure out how you use your floss. Um, I know that on Fat Quarter Shop, they've um, commented on a couple of videos that they're planning on on showing some of the, the ways that um, um, both uh, Priscilla and Chelsea from Stitching with the Housewives uh, store their floss. Uh, Kimberly Jolly from F Fat Quarter Shop has shown on several videos how she stores her floss. Again, she uses a method that works for her. I watch what she does and I go, that will not work for me. And that's okay. It works for her. It, it's her storage. It's her fibers. All it has to do is work for her. 
sorry, it's coming back to me. What's the other one? Okay, silks. Let's talk about silk fibers very briefly. Um, so again, the way you can use those, the same methods that I've shown you are the same ones for those. People do talk about silk fibers a little differently because they do find that, um, you know, if you've bobbinated them, they tend to keep the kinks uh, and it makes your stitching harder than the cotton flosses. Um, so whether it's Weeks Dye Works, Gentle Arts, Classic Color Works, Color and Cotton, whatever those are, um, I don't, I have never actually bobbinated any of my silk fibers. Um, so uh, quite frankly, as you know, when I started, uh, I very rarely bought silk fibers because quite frankly, I couldn't afford them. Do I have a lot more silk fibers now? Yes, because I'm elderly. <laughs> I've been stitching for a long time. Uh, so I have more of those. And by the time I was starting to use my silk flosses, um, whether it's Karen Water Lilies, whether it's NPI, whether it's Soie d'Alger, by then I had already started transitioning to, into floss away bags. So again, um, Part, part of it is just because I've never bobbinated them. Um, anyway, same things. If you're doing canvas work, um, you've got some other problems because you're using different fibers. Again, Rainbow Gallery, I leave them on the card. They stay there. Um, you know, pearl cottons, like if you're using the balls of pearl cottons and the skeins of pearl cottons. Skeins of pearl cottons, when I crack into those things, those go into a floss away bag believe it or not, they too fit into a floss away bag. Um, Karen Water Lilies, for me, goes into a floss away bag. Um, even the pearl cottons on a ball, um, I didn't bring them up. So for Lady Scarlet's Journey, I there it calls for a DMC pearl cotton number eight. And I have that in a floss away bag. Now, when the project is over, does it live in the floss away bag? No, actually, I've got some storage in, in a closet where I put my pearl cotton balls back um, and it won't live in the floss away bag all the time, hence why I don't necessarily label my bags um, like that. Um, but, you know, again, how you store those, what you keep them in has to work for you. And, and in a lot of cases, it may be just trial and error until you find the thing that works best for you. But again, I will put a link to the Facebook page that I am a part of, because if nothing else, there's lots of people with opinions about how to store all, every kind of thing that you could possibly have for needlework in that group. Um, and uh, you can certainly go in there. Don't forget, when you go into a Facebook group, you can always use the search uh, button on there to look for the thing. So whether it's floss organization, fabric storage, um, metallic threads, uh, you know, pearl cotton, whatever it is, you can put whatever it is that you are concerned about the most and put it in there and you can see posts that will pop up on that. And with that, I hope you've had a good week. Uh, I hope you've had a safe week. I hope you're all healthy and I hope that you're finding and taking some time for your stitching to give you some peace and calm in this crazy world that we're all living in. Um, and to let your creative outlet, you know, be expressed. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great week, guys.